I want to continue today uh, with the discussion of, uh, of policy making. So yesterday we focused on the collection and the analytical side. Uh, I want to move more towards the, the policy making uh, part of the, the process today. Uh, and I want to begin uh, by stressing a point that I made yesterday, uh, which is the difference between uh, the policymaking uh, community and the academic community, the way you approach problems. Uh, and the way I'd like to do that uh, is actually to read a, a more extended passage from Dr. Henry Kissinger, uh, who has written uh, quite extensively on this issue. So let me begin with the, uh, with the quote from him. Uh, and here we go. So intellectuals analyze operations of international systems, statesmen build them, and there's a vast difference between the perspective of the analyst and that of the statesman. The analyst can choose which problem he wishes to study, whereas the statesman's problems are imposed on him. The analyst can allot whatever time is necessary to come to a clear conclusion. The overwhelming challenge to the statesman is the pressure of time. The analyst runs no risk. If his conclusions prove wrong, he can write another treatise. The statesman is permitted only one guess. His mistakes are irretrievable. The analyst has available to him all the facts. He will be judged on his intellectual power. The statesman must act on assessments that not, cannot be proved at the time that he is making them. And he will be judged by history on the basis of how wisely he managed the inevitable change. And above all, by how well he preserved the peace. That is why examining how statesmen have dealt with the problem of world order, what worked or failed and why, is not the end of understanding contemporary diplomacy, though it may be its beginning. So time pressure, incomplete information, the necessity to act where not acting is an act, really define the context in which policy making is made. Each problem dissolves itself into uh, a const, uh, to another problem. So there's a constant need for reassessment uh, as the context shifts. Um, the time pressure, uh, I think, is an incomplete information or obviously less of an issue when you're thinking in terms of grand strategy as opposed to the day-to-day -day management of, uh, of global affairs. But nevertheless, if you look at the way American administrations uh, have operated, uh, generally they will make their assessment of the how they want to conduct relations over the next four years uh, in the first few months uh, of the administration. And then they will be uh, challenged to follow through on that over the next four years. And they'll only really begin to reassess if there's a major disruptive event, a discontinuity of some sort. So September 11th uh, in 2001 for the Bush administration caused a major reassessment in the way uh, President Bush conducted his foreign policy. Uh, the Ukraine crisis uh, in 2014 leads to a reassessment of the Obama administration. Now, uh, the United States, since the, the end of the Second World War, uh, has elaborated a, an interagency system uh, that is supposed to help the president make the major foreign policy decisions. Uh, it's supposed to ensure that all the, the relevant information is brought to the table, that differing viewpoints are thoroughly debated, uh, and that the policy that then results is a well-considered uh, assessment of the situation, the challenges the United States faces, uh, and where the United States wants to go. Uh, so let me give you a sort of a very brief overview of that system. So at, at the top of the system, we have the National Security Council. Uh, this is chaired by the President of the United States. It includes the Secretaries of State, Defense, Energy, and the Treasury. The National Security Advisor sits on that council. And as advisors, not policymakers, uh, we have present the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Director of National Intelligence. And this is the, uh, the body that makes uh, the most important uh, strategic decisions for the United States. So the decisions uh, to use uh, military force against Iraq, uh, to use military force to, uh, against Afghanistan in 2001 and 2003 were decisions that were made 
at the highest level of government with the president uh, intimately involved. Uh, if you go down one lower, one layer lower, you have what we call the Principles Committee. Uh, and this is basically the National Security Council without the president. Uh, and this uh, meets um, not all that frequently, uh, it deals with major decisions uh, that don't have to be raised to the level of the president for ultimate decision. Uh, and then below that, we have what we call the Deputies Committee. And this is really the workforce uh, of the uh, of the interagency process. The Deputies Committee, as uh, the name indicates, uh, is consists of the, the deputies of all the key cabinet uh, agencies in national in the national security area, state, defense, energy, the treasury, uh, and so on. Uh, depending on the issue, uh, people from commerce or agriculture may be brought into the process. Uh, this is uh, where most of the decisions are made for the day-to-day -day functioning of the government, um, the short-term functioning of the government. And it's the critical, uh, I would argue, link in the interagency process because it controls the flow of information up. That is, it will decide whether an issue uh, under deliberation needs to be raised to the level of the principles committee or to the president for ultimate decision. Uh, and it's also uh, the, the committee that passes down or funnels down the decisions from the principles or the National Security Council down into the interagency process uh, for, for implementation. Uh, it's also the, uh, the place where many, many times it's decided what issues need to be discussed, what issues need, need to be raised, what issues uh, does the interagency community uh, need to, to focus on uh, to elaborate op, uh, options for decisions either at the deputy level uh, or above. And then finally, the lowest rung in the interagency process uh, and the first uh, level where decision making is made uh, are the various interagency committees uh, that are generally, uh, that generally deal with various functional issues, regional issues, uh, and they're chaired by an assistant secretary of state uh, or a senior director on the National Security Council staff. Now, uh, the nomenclature uh, for these various committees has changed from administration to administration, but the structure has remained basically the same uh, probably since the Kennedy administration uh, in, in the United States. Uh, one of the first documents that a president will sign, one of the first executive orders, uh, is one that sets the structure of the interagency community, defines uh, the role of the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense uh, for the, excuse me, uh, for the course of the administration, uh, determines who's going to chair uh, various interagency meetings. Again, an important issue uh, in any bureaucracy, the issue of turf. Um, uh, people like to chair committees, they like to set the agenda uh, as opposed to being people on the outside who have to push their way and views onto the, uh, uh, onto the policy agenda. So that's the basic structure uh, in which uh, policy is made. Now, the problem for Russia and for Russia policy uh, has changed over time. Uh, if you go back to the Cold War uh, period, uh, at that time, the Soviet Union lay at the center of American foreign policy. Uh, each morning, the intelligence community uh, circulates within the government at the, uh, at the appropriate level, something that's called the National Intelligence Daily, uh, which has a number of articles uh, that relate to important issues on the agenda for the United States, important information that policymakers uh, need to be aware of as they go about their business day to day. During the Cold War, almost all of those articles dealt with the Soviet Union in some way. Uh, even if it was an issue in the third world, uh, the question would be how that related to uh, Soviet global strategy. Same thing for a lot of economic issues, uh, obviously arms control, nuclear security. Uh, uh, and within the government, uh, if you asked um, in the State Department or the Pentagon, you went in and say, who's the Soviet expert here? Everybody would raise his hand. Uh, and the real problem uh, was narrowing the group uh, for effective decision making. So obviously the person in charge of the interagency process, the National Security Council staff, uh, 
or over at the State Department uh, had tremendous influence in the science shaping uh, whose views got into the room, whose views were considered in the interagency process. Now, if you look at what has happened with Russia policy uh, since the Cold War, we have the opposite, uh, the opposite problem. Russia no li longer lies at the center of American foreign policy. If you look at the, the National Intelligence Daily now, uh, certainly when I was serving in the Bush administration uh, in the 2000s, uh, there would be days when none of the articles uh, referred to Russia. Um, we would focus on China, transatlantic relations, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, but rarely on, on Russia. And even on those major problems, uh, Russia uh, was at best a peripheral issue uh, in many cases. Uh, if you look at the way you organize the, uh, the interagency problem, the, the question always was, what is the issue ultimately about? So early on in the, the Bush administration, we had the question of missile defense. Uh, obviously that impacts Russia, uh, but the question you had to ask was missile defense primarily about missile defense or was primarily about Russia? If it's primarily about missile defense, then there's a, uh, a separate directorate uh, in the National Security Council that deals with missile defense, and they would be the directorate uh, along with their counterparts at state uh, that would run the interagency process on missile defense. Uh, Russia was included, but as a, as a voice among many on missile defense. Same thing is true if you took uh, the question of European security or the one that really bedeviled, uh, I think, uh, me uh, during the Bush administration was the question of the former Soviet space. Uh, so uh, is the problem, for example, about Georgia? Or is it about Russia's actions in Georgia? Is the problem about Ukraine? Uh, or is it about Russia's actions in Ukraine? Uh, and the way it was structured uh, in the Bush administration uh, is that uh, we decided that the Georgia problem was about Georgia, first of all. The Ukraine problem was about Ukraine, first of all. Uh, and so we developed policies towards Georgia. We developed policies towards Ukraine. Uh, but we never developed a policy towards the Soviet, excuse me, towards Russia, dealing with the entire former Soviet space. And so the challenge for someone in my position uh, was how did you put together a coherent Russia strategy from all these disparate bits of policy that were made without direct reference to Russia on missile defense, on Ukraine, on Georgia, on energy issues, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, the real challenge was developing a coherent uh, Russia strategy. Uh, and I would be the first to admit that I certainly didn't always succeed in doing that. Uh, but it was a constant challenge. Now, I think what I've just said about the interagency process uh, points up to a, a broader problem uh, that we have in dealing with Russia, uh, Russia now, and that is thinking about, uh, about Russia uh, and putting it at the center of at least some foreign policy considerations. Now, if you look through the, uh, the policymaking process, uh, I think we can say there are six questions that you need to ask if you're going to make policy. Uh, one we discussed yesterday, and that is what is the situation? Uh, that's where the intelligence and the analysis are particularly important. Uh, the next step uh, in the policymaking process is once you have an understanding of what the situation is, uh, the question you have to ask is, what are we trying to do? What does the United States want to do in this situation? But you have to follow that up with a third very important question, and that is, what are the Russians trying to do? Uh, and once you've answered those two questions, then you move on to two other related questions. That is, what resources can we bring to bear on the problem? And then what resources can the Russians bring to bear on that problem? And then finally, you get to the act of policymaking, and that is, so what's possible? What is it that we can do to advance towards our interest over time? So the question is a sequencing uh, in a policymaking process. Uh, 
And so there are various challenges uh, to doing this. Now, what the post-Cold War administrations did very well uh, in the United States is deciding what it was that we wanted to do, what the United States wanted to do in its relationship with Russia uh, in the post-Cold War period. Uh, and I think in broad terms, you can say that the grand strategy of the Clinton administration, the George W. Bush administration, uh, and the Obama administration was to integrate Russia into the Euro-Atlantic community as a free market democracy. So integration uh, was the, the goal. The Clinton administration thought that it could do that in part because it believed that Russia had no choice. So if you, re um, uh, you won't remember, but maybe you run across it in your studies, um, this very famous thesis about the end of history uh, developed by Francis Fukuyama in 1989. The idea that the big battles, ideological struggles of the 20th century uh, among liberalism, communism, and fascism had been won definitively by liberalism, and that the only way countries could thrive going forward was by adopting a, a, liberal, uh, a, a liberal type of system for themselves. So, and that, I think, very much shaped the way the Clinton administration looked at Russia. If Russia was going to survive, if Russia was going to thrive, it had no choice uh, but to develop this liberal market uh, democratic society. And the role of the United States was to assist, perhaps accelerate Russia's transition along that path. Uh, the Bush administration had a slightly different uh, take on this. Uh, and they started from the assumption that Russia was simply too weak uh, to resist American blandishments or pressure. And we would use incentives, a series of incentives and disincentives uh, to move Russia along the path towards liberal market democracy. Uh, and then finally, the Obama administration took yet a third sort of approach to this. Uh, and it didn't have so much a grand plans for the relationship, but it thought that we could move Russia in the proper direction through a series of agreements on a narrow range of security issues, arms control, for example, non-proliferation, uh, dealing with the problems in Afghanistan and Iran, uh, and also on certain economic issues, like finally getting Russia uh, into the, the World Trade Organization as a way of nudging Russia along this path towards liberal Western democracy. Now, even though the, I think the, uh, the framework for the three administrations was different, uh, the, the way they actually conducted the relationship with Russia were, were quite similar. So we tended to work on the same areas. Arms control was very important, non-proliferation, counterterrorism, uh, had some in the Clinton administration, but certainly after the 9-11 uh, attacks in the United States and the Bush administration, uh, we, uh, we developed programs on economic and political reform in Russia. Uh, we pushed trade and investment uh, in Russia uh, and a lot of similar things. Uh, the, all three administrations also set up a, a process for uh, closer ties between the two governments. So in the Clinton administration, we had the so-called Gore Chorter Mirton Commission, uh, chaired by Vice President Gore uh, and the Russian Prime Minister Viktor Chorter Mirton, uh, that brought together uh, a half dozen or so uh, ministries on both sides to work on discrete issues, security issues, defense issues, health issues, educational issues, economic issues, and so forth. Uh, the Obama administration had something similar. Uh, they called it the Bilateral Presidential uh, Commission, which brought uh, together pretty much the same range uh, of agencies, but was overseen not by the Prime Minister and the Vice President, but by the Secretary of State and the Russian Foreign, uh, foreign Minister at that time. Bush administration being a Republican administration, um, and like most Republican administrations, a believer in small government, uh, had something that we called the checklist, uh, which was a series of uh, discrete uh, tasks that were supposed to be performed by various elements uh, of the government. And this was agreed to uh, at the level of uh, 
uh, the National Security Council staff, the deputies, uh, and then farmed out to the, uh, the various agents for implementation. So think of it as the commissions uh, under Clinton and Obama, but without the bureaucracy. Uh, and this is the way uh, we, uh, we all conducted our relations uh, with Russia. Now, if you look back over the uh, course of the, excuse me, of, of those three administrations, I think you can see that the actual policy, the actual accomplishments in the relationship fell well short of the ambitions at the beginning uh, of each administration. Uh, and each administration actually left the relationship in worse shape than they found it. As a grand strategy, the policy was a failure, and that became clear in 2014 uh, with the eruption of the Ukraine crisis. So certainly we hadn't integrated uh, Russia uh, into the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, and certainly today, that is not something that's even on the agenda. Now, as I look back over my own experience in government uh, and at, uh, also the policy of the Obama administration, uh, and the Clinton administrations, I think one of the primary reasons uh, that our strategy didn't succeed is that we failed to do our work in that third problem uh, that I mentioned, that is what do the Russians want? Uh, we neglected Russian goals. Uh, and I think it's clear uh, if you look at what uh, President Yeltsin was saying, what President Putin has said, uh, what other senior Russian officials have been saying since 1991. Uh, that integration into the Euro-Atlantic Committee, uh, excuse me, community was never really a priority for the Russian government, absent a very short, short one or two years after the break of the Soviet Union. Uh, what has been driving Russia policy is really this urge to rebuild, to reassert Russia uh, as a great power on the global stage. Now, Yeltsin uh, thought that the United States, the West in general, uh, should recognize Russia as a great power, despite its weakened condition after the break of the Soviet Union, in part out of gratitude for the role that Russians themselves had at play in putting an end to communism, uh, not only in Russia, but more broadly uh, in the Soviet Union uh, and the former Soviet bloc, uh, but also out of recognition of the large role that Russia had played historically uh, as a major power uh, uh, on the European continent. Uh, when it became clear that the Clinton administration was not going to, to treat Russia as an equal, was not prepared to recognize uh, Russia as a great power, you saw a more concerted effort inside Russia uh, to rebuild uh, Russian power. And this becomes, I think, very clear uh, under President Putin, who begins his term uh, as president uh, focused on rebuilding the state, creating the order that you need uh, as a foundation for Russia uh, as, a great, uh, uh, as a great power on the global stage. Uh, you see a concerted effort uh, to revive the economy, obviously aided by the sharp rise in, in oil prices in the 2000s. Uh, after those two things are in place, you see another concerted effort to modernize the military uh, that begins in 2008 uh, in 2009. Uh, and along the way, and I would argue that it begins to appear in 2005, 2006, uh, you see uh, this effort by, by President Putin to reassert Russia's prerogatives uh, on the global stage, and often in opposition to, to the United States. And you saw this most clearly uh, in the way that President Putin and Russia at that time dealt with Ukraine uh, and Georgia. Uh, so Russia, as I said, really wanted to restore its, its power. And that's what drove all of its policy. Now, this didn't mean that Russia and the United States couldn't cooperate on certain things. Um, certainly, the Russians were interested in strategic arms control. Uh, they were interested in working with the United States on nonproliferation. Uh, but they were interested in that in part because these were areas in which Russia could approach the United States more or less as an equal. Uh, Russia uh, was at that time and remains uh, one of the two major nuclear powers in 
the two countries, the United States and, and Russia, undergirded the, the arms control uh, regime that was in place at that time. Same thing is true on nonproliferation, uh, where Russia clearly has uh, both the, uh, the material to be a serious proliferator uh, and the experience and the ability uh, to prevent proliferation in cooperation with the United States and other countries. Uh, Russia was also prepared uh, in uh, 2000 uh, and going forward to cooperate with the United States on counterterrorism, in part because it also faced a major counterterrorism problem uh, at that time. Now, the cooperation always was somewhat uh, problematic because uh, from the United States uh, standpoint, when we uh, thought of counterterrorism cooperation, we were focused largely on the uh, the major threat to the United States that was posed by Al Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan, uh, but uh, in time more broadly across the, the globe in the Middle East, in Northern Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, and elsewhere. The Russians weren't so concerned about Al Qaeda. They were concerned about the Chechens, uh, uh, who they saw as their major terrorist challenge. And there was always some tension between the United States and Russia uh, because uh, we didn't accept all of the Chechens as terrorists the way Russia did. We thought there was a certain element within the, uh, the Chechen rebellion uh, that had legitimate grievances against Moscow. And that was always a point of friction in the cooperation. Yet at a very abstract level, uh, we did do certain things together on counterterrorism. Uh, it was also possible to uh, cooperate to a certain extent on trade and investment. Uh, because the Russians realized that these, um, that these efforts were critical to its own desire uh, to rebuild its economy, uh, to build a, a competitive Russian economy that could sustain Russians' ambitions to be a great power over the long term. Where we began to have problems with the Russians were in two very important areas, and, they've, and these have bedeviled the relationship, I think, from the very end of the, uh, of, of the Cold War. One was an economic and political reform. Uh, and Russia clearly came to see uh, this effort by the United States as interference in Russian domestic politics. Uh, and in the, the Putin years, uh, this becomes uh, or transformed in the view uh, that the United States is using politically, particularly political reform, uh, support to various uh, non-governmental organizations, political parties and so forth uh, as a way of developing tools and instruments that could be used to undermine the Kremlin. That is, that this is a preparation for regime change in Russia itself. Uh, and Putin and others in the Kremlin would look at how political reform and economic reform uh, elsewhere in the Soviet Union led to uh, regime change and regime change that Russia found uh, disfavorable to Russia's own standing uh, in the world. Uh, the other area, which I've already hinted at, uh, that was problematic was uh, the former Soviet space, uh, where the United States uh, always argued that our goal was to promote liberal democracy, free markets uh, in, these, in these countries. And we could never understand why Russia would object to what, uh, what we saw as an effort to build prosperous democratic societies along, uh, along Russia's periphery. We looked at this from the Kremlin standpoint. Uh, it wasn't so much that the Kremlin objected to prosperous democratic societies along its borders. It was that whenever the United States did this in a major way, it appeared to be supporting local leaders uh, who were fundamentally anti-Russian in their political orientation and foreign policy orientation. So if you think back to Ukraine in 2004, um, the presidential election at that time, <clears throat> it did someone who was very close to the Russians, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, against someone much more pro-Western in orientation, uh, Viktor uh, Yushchenko. Uh, and although the United States claimed at that time that all we were doing was supporting free and fair elections, uh, a lot of the uh, real support went to the forces that were back at Yushchenko uh, at that point. And the Orange Revolution 
um, is seen as a victory for U.S. policy, um, promoting democracy, but also led to the election uh, of Yushchenko as president of Ukraine, and a defeat for Russia uh, and, for, and one personally for Putin because uh, he had supported uh, Yanukovych in that election. Something similar happens in, in Georgia, uh, where our support is largely for uh, 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 Saakashvili at that time. And Saakashvili uh, clearly had a, uh, a, an anti-Russian orientation, wanting to move Georgia uh, away from Russia uh, towards, the, towards the United States. And so what Russia saw uh, the United States doing in the former Soviet space was not so much uh, promoting democracy as it was undermining what the Russians believed were the uh, geopolitical foundations of Russia's security, that is the former Soviet space, and also the region that historically that had provided Russia much of its geopolitical heft uh, on, the, uh, on the international stage. Uh, and so that led to uh, increasing tension between the United States and Russia. Uh, and so we started with a, uh, a relationship with Russia in 1991, 1992, that was largely cooperative uh, under Yeltsin. Uh, in a very few years, uh, we could see the elements of competition reemerging in the relationship. That all accelerated uh, under, uh, under President Putin. Uh, and eventually with 2014 and the Ukraine crisis, it turns into a, a policy of a confrontation. And all of this, I think, ultimately grows out of this mismatch in ambitions uh, between the two countries. So the US goal very much was to change Russia, uh, to turn it into a liberal Western democracy. The Russian goal all along was to reassert Russia as a great power on the international stage. Now, uh, let me just end uh, with a few thoughts on whether we could have managed the relationship uh, better. Uh, my own view is that, uh, that this relationship is fundamentally competitive, competitive uh, for a number of reasons that are re related to the way we look at world order, the different uh, concepts of exceptionalism that the two countries have, uh, various regional uh, uh, disputes that have been endemic uh, to Russian uh, and American uh, relations from the time the United States emerged as a major global power at the end of the 19th century, the fundamentally different values that informed the, uh, the foundations of our political sy uh, systems uh, and, our, and our society. So it's a competitive relationship, but that doesn't mean that you can't manage that relationship uh, in a better way and that you can't add elements uh, of cooperation. Uh, the critical moment, I think, in this development of U.S.-Russian relations after the uh, Cold War is actually the Bush administration. Uh, and this is the moment when the two countries had uh, the best opportunity to forge a more cooperative and less uh, uh, sharply competitive relationship. Uh, and that grew out of two reasons. One was that the United States was clearly uh, the dominant world power at that point. We had no par parallel, no equal anywhere else in the world. It's long before China emerges as a, major, uh, as a major challenge. But also in the early years of Putin, Russia was finally beginning to reorganize its state, putting some order into, um, into, its, into its policy making so that Russia could actually act as a partner with the United States on the global stage in a way it couldn't have uh, during the 1990s in a period of tremendous disarray and chaos under Yeltsin. Uh, now, what I think the United States should have done at this point uh, is sort of tested Russia's commitment uh, to genuine partnership. Uh, and we could have done this in a number of ways, which we didn't. Uh, to take a, a one good example, uh, in 2002, uh, along with our NATO allies, we set up uh, what was called the NATO-Russia Council. And the idea behind this council was that Russia would sit down with the then 19 uh, NATO allies, each on a national basis, uh, and we would discuss 
a range of issues uh, and make joint decisions on how to pursue uh, our goals uh, in the, along these various issues. Now, the issues concern things like counterterrorism, obviously, at that time, search and rescue operations, particularly at sea, nonproliferation, theater missile defense, crisis management, and so forth. There were nine discrete areas uh, in which uh, we were going to, to cooperate. And the idea was if this worked out, if Russia functioned well uh, with the 19 as sort of an equal member on this council, that over time we could expand the areas uh, in which the, uh, the council dealt uh, to a, a much broader range, a much more serious range of issues and a much more sensitive range of issues. Now, the problem was that from the very beginning, uh, the United States and the Bush administration wasn't prepared uh, to deal with this council uh, as a meeting of 20 individual countries dealing on their national basis. What we did and what we insisted on was that NATO would get together before each meeting of the national, uh, of the NATO Russia Council uh, in what we call the North Atlantic Council, the primary decision-making body of the, of the NATO alliance. And in that meeting, we would agree on what the common NATO position would be on the issue that we were going to discuss in the NATO Russia Council. So you didn't have 19 plus one, you didn't have 20 uh, countries sitting at the table. You had NATO in which 19 NATO members were obliged to, pers uh, to present and pursue uh, and support a certain approach to a problem and a Russian approach that may or may not differ, uh, different from the, um, from the NATO approach. Again, it didn't take the Russians long to figure out what was going on. Uh, so I think that made the, the council less attractive to them. Um, and my argument always was that we ought to try at least one, one issue where we don't have the NATO or, or the, the NATO alliance agree beforehand what the unified position is going to be and see how the Russians conduct themselves and see what impact it has on, on alliance unity. And it worked out well, then we continued down this process. If it turned out bad, uh, because we had predominant uh, influence at that point because of our power, uh, we could always find an off-ramp with very little loss to our, uh, to our ultimate position vis-a-vis -vis the Russian, vis-a-vis -vis our allies. And we had similar problems like this with a range of other issues. Uh, in Afghanistan, for example, uh, the Russians came to us uh, in 2001 and 2002 uh, with a proposal that uh, uh, that we could use their strategic airlift capability uh, to fly uh, material into, into Afghanistan. And the Russians would fly in material as well that was needed for various purposes. Now, uh, there are only a very few countries uh, in the world that can provide strategic airlift. The United States is one of them, Russia is another. Uh, Ukraine actually happens to be a, a third country that can do that. Uh, but we resisted uh, the Russian effort to do that uh, because we uh, were concerned that this would lead to a Russian presence on the ground at the Bagram Air Force Base just outside of Kabul, and that this would allow the Russians uh, to meddle in Afghan affairs in ways that we would find uh, inappropriate for American goals. Uh, again, an area where we didn't trust the Russians sufficiently uh, to work with us in a cooperative way in Afghanistan. Now, the only thing I can say uh, that in justification of the American position on that uh, is in that in 2001, 2002, we actually didn't want our allies to participate much in Afghanistan uh, either. We wanted to make it very much an American, uh, an American-led, American-controlled, and almost a solely American operation at that point. But again, I think we lost an opportunity to test Russia's commitment uh, to partnership. Uh, and then the final uh, time that this came up uh, in an issue that I was involved in uh, was around 2005, uh, when the Russians came to us uh, with a proposal on arms sales. Uh, they knew that uh, we were concerned about their arms sales to countries like Venezuela, Syria. Uh, and what they proposed uh, was that uh, we would allow Russia to sell weapons to the Iraqi army. Russia would become the primary 
uh, exporter or supplier of weapons to the Iraqi army uh, on the argument that much of the Iraqi army had been, uh, had been equipped by the Soviet Union. They were using uh, Soviet weaponry, uh, Russian weaponry, and there would be a, a close fit between what the Russians could provide and what the Iraqis needed at this point. Uh, this was particularly uh, frustrating for me because uh, this was a case where uh, this rose through the through the interagency process uh, and actually had uh, a, a tentative approval from the President of the United States uh, to go forward and to try to develop this in some way. Uh, the program was finally halted uh, by the Pentagon on the argument that the United States legally couldn't do this uh, because that would be the equivalent, that is allowing uh, the, the Russians, identifying the Russians as the main supplier for the Iraqi army, uh, would be what we call a non-compete contract. That is, we wouldn't open the contract up to competition by other countries. Uh, and the Pentagon was sure that there were a number of former Warsaw Pact countries, Poland in particular, that also had access Soviet-made weaponry that they would like to sell uh, to the Iraqi army. Uh, and therefore, we had to open it up to competition. Um, the Russians were less interested in it uh, under those conditions. Uh, and actually, the Poles were favored uh, in the, the actual competition for, con uh, for contracts. So I think there were a number of times during the Bush administration uh, where we had at least interesting proposals, interesting opportunities where the United States could have tested Russia's commitment uh, to cooperation. If it worked out, we could have proceeded and deepened it. Uh, and if it didn't work out the way we wanted, I think the United States was in a sufficiently uh, powerful position that we could have backed away with that very little loss to our, our position, to our agenda, to our overall relationship uh, with the Russians going forward. So that I think is, uh, is a brief sort of history of where we come over the past, uh, over the past, uh, over the past uh, two and a half decades, three decades, from tentative cooperation, competition, and confrontation. And I think the question now that uh, the Trump administration faces, uh, whatever administration that comes to power, uh, or comes into office on January 20th of, of next year will face, is that is how do we begin to restrain this competition with Russia, to take it off the dangerous path we're on and put it into a more constructive path uh, that allows the two countries to compete safely going forward. So let me end there uh, and I'm more than happy to entertain your, entertain your questions. Wonderful. Okay, who would like to go first? Yeah, I don't know how we identify people here. People raise uh, Yeah. <laughs> So if you if you can use Eric, your, you, um, raise hand, that would be great. But I see Sos is actually raising his hand. Um, yeah. So go ahead, Sos. Um, thank you, thank you, Professor Graham. I was also wondering, like you kind of touched upon that, but I was also wondering about the type of the regime that has this decision making in it. Basically, USA is considered a de democratic country; Russia is not. And, and what kind of a strategic edge does it give to the given polity, having or not having a democracy? Because any decision you make in the Security Council above or below, yeah. it has to be counted uh, also domestically. Or is it really? Um, does it really matter uh, in that way? You know, it's an interesting question. And you can argue this uh, in, uh, in different ways. Uh, you know, certainly I would argue uh, that over the past 70 years, by and large, American foreign policy has been much more successful than Soviet than Russian foreign policy. Uh, obviously, we've had our ups and downs, uh, our setbacks, zigs and zags. There have been areas uh, where the Soviet Union or Russia appear to be succeeded. But if you look at the broad uh, sort of arc of history, I think the United States has performed much better, uh, despite what you would think uh, as a much messier uh, political process, an interagency process. Uh, 
you know, one of the reasons I think that we have succeeded over time is in fact, because we've had serious debates, uh, we do bring in uh, dissident points of views. We do ultimately look at all the relevant information uh, as we, excuse me, as we develop our policy, as we shift our policy over, over time. Uh, and second, uh, all of this is done in the context of a very lively public debate uh, about American uh, foreign policy. Uh, American pol foreign policy succeeds when it enjoys the support of the population. Uh, and no democratic country actually can pursue a foreign policy for long without, without that support. We saw that in the United States, for example, uh, during the Viet 